my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mariana Mazzucata for a presentation on the entrepreneurial state, rethinking risks and rewards in innovation. Mariana is a professor of economics and the R.M. Phillips Chair in Science and Technology Policy at the University of Sussex. Her research focuses on the relationship between financial markets, innovation, and economic growth at the company, industry, and national level. In 2013, the New Republic called her one of the three most important thinkers about innovation. And recently, Forbes said about her work, this is going to sound heretical to everything Forbes has stood for for over 96 years. So on that note, I welcome to the stage Dr. Mariana Mazzucata. Well, thank you very much, Cheryl, for this kind introduction. Um, and it's such an honor for me to be here in ARPA-E's uh, setting, because for the last couple of years, I've actually been asking myself what economists, because I am an economist, actually have to say about an organization like ARPA-E. And by that I mean a public sector organization that's dynamic, it's innovative, it's creative, it has a buzz. I don't know if you've ever been to their offices, but it really does kind of feel like Google. This is something that an author of a book called uh, The New New Deal said about ARPA-E. And the answer to that question is economists actually have very little to say about such a public sector organization. And um, I don't want to shock you that uh, economists have little to say because in fact they talk all the time, but it's very important when economists don't have a framework to understand something, because in fact, as this wonderful quote here, it's very long, but it's completely worth reading, as this wonderful quote by Keynes uh, suggests, many policymakers, businessmen and women, practical thinkers who think they're completely devoid of influence are actually the slaves of a defunct economist. That um, ending there is wonderful. He says, uh, mad men in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. I'm sure that the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. Um, in other words, you know, the whole problem of capture is less than this encroachment of ideas. And what I think I want to do in terms of the big takeaway of the next 20 minutes is to de-encroach ourselves um, because it's very important because in fact ARPA-E as well as all sorts of uh, organizations in the U.S. government which has had a very decentralized but active state in innovation, a very visible, not invisible hand, um, these organizations are very important and if we don't understand them, they really risk disappearing. And by the way, it's not just agencies that are in charge of innovation that are at risk of disappearing, but for example, in the UK where I live, a very active public sector agency in a completely different realm, which is the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, which is extremely innovative. For example, it invested its own funds into the iPlayer, which is a very innovative um, platform for, for disseminating all their broadcasting TV and radio was done in-house. They didn't outsource it, right? There's this whole trend, as you know, of outsourcing all sorts of government services, especially around IT. And the BBC really made a very courageous decision to invest in it itself. And it has, in fact, remained an innovative organization precisely because by doing something like that, it actually becomes a really exciting place to work. And I think this is a really big challenge for public sector organizations, which is how to remain dynamic and creative so you attract serious talent, which is something I'll come back to at the end, so that it's just as fun to work in ARPA-E or the BBC as it is in Google or, God forbid, Goldman Sachs. Now, what do I mean when I say that economists have little to say about ARPA-E? What I mean is that the standard framework we have um, besides when we're just saying the state should get out of the way, I'll assume that we're not in that uh, setting right now, is that what the state does through its different agencies at best is if you want to fix different types of market failures, okay? So a typical market failure is when you have, say, a public good, which is very hard to appropriate the returns to that, basic research, my father, the reason I sound American but I'm actually Italian is because my father works in nuclear fusion and that's a typical area where we know it's very hard to appropriate even if it ever came about and hence it's very normal that you have government funding for nuclear fusion, okay? Now the issue is of course that if you look at um, all sorts of different technological revolutions that have happened over the last century, uh, whether we're talking about the IT revolution, the biotech revolution, the nanotech revolution, or the clean tech revolution, 
what different types of public sector agencies did was much more than that. And the problem is that we don't admit it. I mean, this wonderful quote here by The Economist is a typical uh, way that uh, people think, and I think it's quite common, um, uh, which is that, you know, yes, of course, government's important. They should fund the infrastructure, the schools, the education, the skills, but the real kind of dynamism, the creativity, will always be in the private sector. Okay? And so we should leave the rest to the revolutionaries. This was in a particular uh, special issue that was dedicated to all the new emerging technologies where a big chunk of that was, in fact, in clean technology. And what I argue, sorry about this little self-promotion here in this book that I just wrote, um, is that, in fact, if we look at all these different revolutions, including, and I'll get to the clean tech revolution um, towards the end, uh, what we see is that, in fact, lots of the revolutionary, creative, crazy stuff has actually come from government, working, of course, with the private sector. But the problem is we know, of course, that the private sector is important. We hear about it all the time. So I don't want to diminish that at all. Don't get me wrong. The problem is we don't talk about enough, we don't analyze enough the role of the public sector. And hence, in a time where we need dynamic public-private partnerships, right, this is the new trendy word, if we don't have a framework and even a theory to talk about the public part, it's actually going to be really hard to set up those uh, partnerships in a way that are um, symbiotic, if you want, and not, um, well, the reason I use the word symbiotic is often when we talk about the partnerships, we talk about ecosystems, right, ecosystems of innovation. And one of my worries, which um, will be how I conclude, is that these ecosystems that we're setting up today are not very symbiotic. They're actually quite parasitic. And I want to link that back to this problem that we don't have a framework through which to understand the public part. Now, as I said, um, you know, it's going to be very hard to just use the framework of market failure to talk about the uh, emergence of all these general purpose technologies, which are those really important technologies which actually increase productivity across all sectors. And every single one of these technologies, in fact, had the state. And when I use the word state, let me just say this now, because I'm not talking about you know, big brother, the big state. I am, in fact, talking about this decentralized network state through agencies exactly like ARPA-E, DARPA, the National Institutes of Health, the Small Business Innovation Research Program. There's about 17 of them, if you want, that have been very active in the US innovation economy. And what it, it's had, and the reason why I call it the entrepreneurial state, is when you think of the word entrepreneurship, it's not just setting up a company, right, a startup. It's actually the ability and willingness to really take on real uncertainty and real risk. And if you look at this space here, it's really that upper right-hand quadrant, which is often um, where you don't see enough private finance. And in fact, in all those different uh, revolutions that I mentioned before, it's, it's, it's precisely that upper right-hand space where you have high technological and market uncertainty and high capital intensity, where you've actually had uh, needed, if you want, these different types of investments coming from the public sector. And what's especially interesting is that, in fact, if you look at the entire innovation chain, from the basic research down to the actual product when it's commercialized, it's not true that the role of the public sector in the US, which is often talked about in Europe as you know, the model of an innovation economy that works, it's not true that we've just had the, the sort of basic research being funded by uh, the public sector. In fact, again, ARPA E is a typical example of an agency that's also working downstream. But also, um, you know, when we look at the startup uh, risk, if you want, the risk in the really early stage of companies, which of course we're talking about more downstream when the companies actually get involved, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which has funded lots of the early stage, has actually over time have to come, have become even more important. Okay, so it's not that somehow they can just retract at some point because we have an advanced capitalist society. What unfortunately has also happened is that private finance itself has become increasingly short-termist. Um, innovation takes 15 to 20 years. The venture capital industry increasingly wants its returns in three to five years. More three, five is already almost long-term. And lots of the emphasis from the beginning is on the exit stage. And what we see is that in some sectors like biotechnology, this has led to this wonderful word, plepos, productless IPOs, because the, um, you know, all the attention is, in fact, on the exit through the IPO. And it's very hard, actually, to nurture real sort of new products in that sector when things are, if you want, rushed. Um, in some areas, like gadgets, it's actually, you know, things can happen in three to five years. In clean technology, in nanotechnology, in biotechnology, three to five years is nothing. Now, you know, Steve Jobs, of course, he was a genius. Um, I hope many of you have probably read his. Uh, 
a biography, which is a great uh, big tome, but there's not one page in that tome that actually talks about how you know, most of the uh, Apple products, at least the recent products, really completely depend on their smartness. The smartness of these products depends, in fact, on this government research, which Lamar Alexander was talking about. I mean, why an iPhone is smart and not stupid is what you can do with that phone. Coming back also to Thomas Friedman's point this morning that what's important is what you can do with this new technology. And what can you do with an iPhone? You can surf the internet. You can use GPS to know where you are. You can you know, use touchscreen display. There's even this new Siri voice activated personal assistant was all funded by different types of government agencies, which I list there. And you know, the problem is simply that many people don't know this. Um, and and it's, it's a real problem when people don't know it, because also say, you know, with the whole Obamacare debate recently, imagine how different that debate would have been if this was known, for example, just how much the National Institutes of Health have spent over the last, I uh, can't remember my dates here, since 1938, um, almost $800 billion, not only, but also that particular funding, what's great about this sector is you can actually differentiate the new medicines that are coming out on the ones that really are revolutionary. These are the new molecular entities with priority rating versus, say, Me Too drugs, slight variations of existing drugs. And it turns out that that funding has actually been responsible for some of the most revolutionary new drugs. Now, when I talk about that debate, you know, the Obamacare debate, without taking a position on that, the simple point is that the discourse, the language that was used, you know, government meddling in our healthcare choices, if this kind of information was known out there, and I really wonder why it's not, and why Obama himself didn't actually talk more about this, it'd be very hard to talk about the government meddling in this really innovative pharmaceutical industry. Right? Because what this data shows here is the government itself, along with the private sector, has actually been responsible for innovation, for actually producing lots of the drugs itself, in fact, some of the most innovative drugs. 75% of the new molecular et entities are actually coming out of National um, Institute of Health funding. This is very important information that people don't know. Um, now, what are the lessons for the green technology revolution? And, and, and by the way, when I say green revolution, I should be careful, because this isn't just about solar, wind, biofuels. It's also, of course, about transforming every single sector, right? So new engines and cars, uh, new ways to produce, to distribute, and to consume. Um, well, what we know from looking at these other sectors is, in fact, you know, private capital alone has not, in fact, uh, if, you know, you know, brought about these revolutionary new technologies. but in many cases has actually had to push, kick, not just nudge. Um, and also that the actual agencies like ARPA-E that have been very important, or you know, looking back at DARPA, and I know people talk a lot about DARPA, but you know, what's very important about DARPA is that it was really able to attract serious talent, but also the Department of Energy. I mean, in Europe, we don't have anything like a Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist, as was recently uh, you know, directing Department of Energy, directing anything in Europe, because we keep thinking that, you know, what is the source of the secret of Silicon Valley is, of course, you know, the market model, it's the venture capitalists, and so what we need to do in order to um, inspire that kind of growth, smart growth, is, in fact, you know, leave things more to the market, and it's really hard to attract expertise and talent, serious talent, into government if what you're told every day is that all the really creative, interesting stuff is not done in government. This is a real problem. And I think it's also becoming also a problem in the US. But until recently, it's fascinating that one of the countries in the world that was sold to the rest of us as you know, the market model was actually such an interventionist country in terms of innovation and able to bring into the public sector you know, the big brains. Um, and, and also, of course, a very important part of, for example, the IT revolution was that we did have dynamic public-private partnerships. Xerox PARC, Bell Labs, these were private um, you know, research labs working very closely with government. And so the real question today with clean technology, well, green technology, whatever you want to call it, is not just that, of course, we need this active state that has, you know, does in, clean, in that clean tech space what the state did in the biotech, IT, the nanotech space, but also that it's really able to engage with the private sector in a confident way where it's not just giving, but also really working along on the side. Um, and, and just looking again at that sort of risk space that I was talking about before, that upper right-hand quadrant that now I'm showing you with clean technology is really completely starved of private finance. You know, VC is not going there. 
Um, and we also know that recently, unfortunately, private R&D spending has been falling in uh, clean technology, but also the public sector spending in the US, also across the world, but the public sector spending in, in R&D, um, even though it's been mildly protected uh, with the recent threats that it was gonna be cut much more, you don't just protect, you don't just safeguard publicly spent public spending on R&D, you really have to increase it because you're working in a competitive economy where other countries like China are increasing it. Um, I think China increased its public R&D spending by 170% in the last five years. It's spending 1.7 trillion, trillion dollars in the next five years on these five emerging sectors, um, including uh, new engines, including uh, clean technology, I think they call it environmentally friendly technologies. But what's interesting when you look at all those sectors is the particular spaces that they're occupying in each sector is actually quite green. Um, and what's interesting, again, across the world is that as private finance has been retreating, okay, and you know, there's all this talk about financialization, I'll, I'll show you a graph later, where the private financial institutions really kind of completely outpaced the real value added precisely because they were just lending to each other, right? The mortgage securities, uh, you know, the banks lending to the mortgage, mortgage, uh, mortgage securities, the hedge funds and derivatives, not really nurturing real growth in the real economy. Um, but public financial institutions in the world have actually had to step up to the game. Uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance did a study recently of all the different types of finance and clean technology today. Um, and they looked at it over the last uh, 10 years. And I remember the figures for 2012. If you take all of private finance in the world and add it up, okay, so this is private equity, venture capital, stock market, and corporate investments in renewable energy, it totaled $12.5 billion in 2012. You take then just the public banks, okay? We don't have them in the US. There is one in uh, North Dakota, apparently. Um, and some smaller ones, but you don't have these big public financial institutions. So I'm, I'm talking about the KFW in Germany, the China Development Bank, um, the Brazilian Development Bank, the European Investment Bank. Just take the, sometimes they're called development banks, sometimes state investment banks. They totaled 80 billion just in 2012. Now what's interesting is that with some of these countries that really are mission oriented, so they're not just uh, you know, trying to solve diff uh, different types of market failures, but they're really going for the big missions, whether this was in the past in the US putting a man on the moon or a woman on the moon, today it is happily in many countries trying to tackle climate change. Um, Merkel has made this very explicit, but so did both um, the two recent administrations in Brazil, where the macroeconomic strategy really was to sort of you know, inspire growth in a particular direction through uh, green investments. The, this, these are the numbers for Germany where this particular public investment bank not only was counter cyclical, which is of course one of the key roles of the public sector that when business spends too much during the boom, too little in the bust, what the government should be doing is the opposite. So this is what these banks do all the time. They kind of bring in credit precisely when the private financial institutions take credit away. But what's interesting here is that their counter cyclical spending was actually quite directed towards renewable energy. This is also true of the China Development Bank. There's a great new book out that's actually called China Development Bank Changing the Rules of Finance. They are, you know, really picking winners. This is the real fear, right? That government should just be kind of creating the uh, level playing field and not pick particular technologies, particular companies. We know this isn't true for the US. I mean, the US, the SBIR program picked um, a Compaq, Intel, SBIC picked Apple. Apple got 500,000 from the SBIC program in the beginning. That's a lot of money when you're just starting off. We know, of course, Solyndra and Tesla were both picked. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But China, look at these numbers. These are massive. You know, I mean, Solyndra got what? A 500 million guaranteed loan from Obama. It went bust. This is the same amount of money that Tesla got. It didn't go bust. Most people know the Solyndra story. They don't remember that Tesla as well got that kind of guaranteed loan from the government. Um, but these numbers are absolutely spectacular uh, that these green companies are getting in China. And Huawei in telecommunications, which is number one today in telecommunications without the US market, um, you know, got a similar amount of funding. And why is Huawei not in the US, you know, in the US telecommunications market because they're deemed to be anti-competitive, right? Because they're getting all this kind of state aid. There's also some security issues. But the real question is, if what you need to be innovative is not just finance, there's in fact plenty of finance out there. What you need to be innovative, a company, but also a technology to emerge is patient 
long-term committed finance. And there's very little of that out there. And so the problem is, if it's only, or especially, these public institutions that are providing it, for example, uh, these public banks, does this kind of go against the competition rules? And what, you know, how can we make sense, then, of a capitalist system which, in fact, depends on innovation? That's what kind of you know, differentiates capitalism from feudalism. Feudalism was 500 years of inertia, no technological change. Capitalism, which we all know is very much based on firms differentiating themselves through innovation, well, how can we then call, or should we at least, maybe I should put it as a question, should we in fact revise how we think about competition rules when in fact what these companies need to be innovative is this kind of public, patient, long-term committed finance? Um, and you know, the problem, as I said before, is that in fact the financial sector itself has been mainly lending to it, well, lending to itself. This is a great figure from the Bank of England. It's even worse for the US economy. It shows how much financial, financial intermediation the gross value added completely outpaced the value added of the real economy. Um, however, the problem is much worse. The problem is not just the hedge funds, the derivatives, the credit default swaps. The problem is just how much the real economy itself has become financialized. And by that, I mean just how much you know, companies today, especially the very large companies, are betting on very short-term um, profit increasing strategies like share buybacks, which this figure here not only shows you that you know, the, there's been three trillion in the last 10 years spent by the Fortune 500 companies just on buying back their own shares, but that black line is what's scary. That black line, which starts in around 2000 to peak up, is R&D to share buybacks. Now when you ask these companies, why are you doing that? You know, um, I don't know how to go back. Oh well, stick with, um, with um, Bill Gates for a minute. Um, when, when you ask those companies, why are you spending so much on share buybacks and not on things like R&D and human capital? Many of these companies, especially in the two sectors that do the most share buybacks, which are uh, energy, the oil companies, and, um, and uh, um, pharmaceutical companies, they say that there's no opportunities. Right? This is the right thing to do, to sort of give money back to your shareholders when there's no opportunities, because, well, no opportunities for investment. But then you actually go look at who's spending, you know, in that sort of health space, the really radical stuff in the health space and in the renewable energy space. And the problem is not that those opportunities aren't there, but we simply don't have that kind of public-private, if you want, engagement today in doing that crazy stuff. Um, and, you know, that's not true everywhere. I mean, this is a great uh, quote by Bill Gates himself, who's part of this American Energy Industry Council, made up of seven CEOs of top companies, which really are instead asking the US government to you know, actually step up to the game. In fact, in 2010, they asked it to spend an extra billion on ARPA-E, which is, of course, a great thing. However, uh, we did a bit of calculation there just of those seven companies that are um, representing the AEIC. And you know, in the last 10 years, they spent uh, 237 on share buybacks, which, again, the problem is not just share buybacks. To me, that's just a proxy for this real kind of sickness that we have today in the real economy. As we know, Apple itself is now going down that route. Steve Jobs would be turning in this grave. Um, he didn't allow any share buybacks under his rule. Okay? To be innovative, you actually have to reinvest your profits in areas like R&D. You have to do that alongside the state with these dynamic public-private partnerships. But it's not enough to talk about ecosystems. We really need to start getting indicators of what kind of ecosystem we want and to have the courage to demand it. Um, and lastly, Got to have two minutes. That's more than I need, so I can slow down. Um, lastly, you know, we s spoke this morning. Um, Tom Friedman's talk, which I thought was really good, um, about you know this problem of inequality, this lack of, if you want, you know, middle class jobs, and all the problems that we know that's causing. I mean, there's all this talk, of course, with the Occupy Wall Street on the one percent, the ninety-nine percent. This is actually causing all sorts of, uh, you know, street protests across the world. And many top thinkers are thinking about this, including Amartya Sen, Joe Stiglitz, um, and others. And the problem I have often with how this is talked about is it's talked about as if it's just a problem of skills, right? That somehow, you know, when you have innovation, technological revolutions, many people get left behind. I have a different take, even though I think that's a huge problem with the skill problem. We need the retraining. The problem that I see, at least with the 1%, is that when we've had these big technological revolutions, and I really do hope and believe that the next one will be in that green space, because we haven't had a narrative, again, kind of the discourse as well as a theory about who the different actors are that are actually creating that new wealth, we've actually allowed all sorts of wealth extraction, okay, that some agents in the system that are important, 
have actually been able to extract much more than they've actually put in. And I think this is a huge problem because our critiques of value extraction, because many people are talking about that, right? Too much speculation, too much rent seeking, has to be, however, linked to a theory of, well, where does wealth come from in the first place? And because I think we haven't actually really engaged with the public part of that, um, and by the public part of that, I actually mean you know, the taxpayers who are funding it. It's taxpayer money that is funding ARPA-E. We actually, I think, have given a sort of a cheap ride to the taxpayer because many of these companies don't pay tax, and I'm not the one saying it. We know this is true. It's in the front pages of all the major international newspapers. Many of the jobs go abroad. So we should, I think, perhaps start thinking a bit more about this risk-reward relationship. We don't just socialize the risks. Let's also socialize the rewards. Now, this is just a list here of some tools, if you want, that I've been thinking of, you know, you know, retaining maybe a golden share of some of the IPR, retaining some equity. This is done in Scandinavia, it's done in Israel, where you have very active public agencies investing in innovation, retaining a bit of equity. Why? To fund the losses, right? Solyndra is a loss, let's fund that, so, it, you know, cover it, um, and to fund the next round. So what I mean by that is, you know, just imagine if 1% of the profits that were generated from that internet uh, investments, of course, how you actually calculate that is very complicated, but there's plenty of lawyers out there that can do it, were coming back into state coffers, let's just call it an innovation fund, there'd be so much more money today to be spending in um, clean technology, and that would allow us to have not just smart growth, not just green growth, but also inclusive growth. Because it really is true that in many places that really have been some of the smartest in the world, like Silicon Valley, it's not very clear why it is that you know, the public school system has gone completely down the drain. If taxpayers fund lots of this stuff, again, all the technology behind Apple, the, you know, Google's algorithm was funded by the taxpayer through the National Science Foundation, why aren't we more concerned with how to socialize the rewards? And I'm done. <laughs>